few weeks, I have spent time working alongside the scriptures that have been offered to find creative and inspiring and life-altering ways to remind all of us that the church needs money. We need money. We need money because the people and the saints before us continue to call us through the echoes of their lives to share a message of love through Jesus to others around us. We need money because faith is crucial and needs to be shared with the children who are part of our lives and world. We need money to do what God has called us to do. We need money so that we can go outside of these walls to a community that needs us in many different ways. We need money to have our kids and our families and our adults go to camp and to know us through their schools and beyond. We need money so that when people come into this place to be both challenged and comforted, we don't want them sweating to death when the air conditioning finally breaks. You see, we need money to help us have the tools to do what God continues to call us to do. But however, as much as we need money, the crucial piece that we always have to be reminded of and remember is that money, of course, is not all we need. So often we live in a world where money becomes all we need and the actual faith and beliefs and deep feelings in our hearts become something that isn't faith in God driven. We find ourselves, all of us, again and again, giving in to the misguided idols that come with buying our faith and not being our faith. What does it mean to be our faith? After last week of being reminded how divided and how hurting our country is at the moment, as we have talked about, we even recognize that there are so many differences and divisions in this room. And so we come to today's scripture, as we should as Christians, seeking to understand God through this message. And it is the Good Samaritan. A story that most of us actually know, but like many stories in the Bible, becomes much more profound each time it is read and studied, especially when our current events call us to seek understanding in our faith. When I have spent time with this scripture, I have often found people at camp or preparing a sermon being asked, who are you in this story? Are you the priest, the robbers, the listener, the Levite, the injured man, the lawyer, the innkeeper? Who are you at this time in this story? And while I've experienced this story that way, I've come to realize that the labels in this story is what actually limits all of us from seeing it. That it isn't who are you, but what are the actions of those that are part of the story that matters. It is the actions in this parable of the characters that tell us the real story of how to be people of faith. Just like today, the labels tell a story of deep-seated mistrust that can turn into hatred, and pain that severely divided the Hebrews and the Samaritans. But if we take away the labels of this story and just see the actions, then we are able to really engage in conversations about how complex each person truly is, and yet how so many things bring us together in our world in loving ways. That we live in a world where people are not labels, but stories much farther beyond that. But it's not easy. It's never been easy. In this story, there are hundreds of years of conflict that are happening within the painful structures. 
You see, the story of the Good Samaritan actually begins with the story we heard today in Children Worship and Wonder. The story of the exile is the most important story in the Hebrew scriptures for the majority of the Old Testament. The people didn't know what to do when the building was gone. They didn't know what to do when they were out of the land that they had been promised. What's interesting is today's children's story tells you that everybody left. But when you actually study the scriptures, you realize that not everybody was taken to Babylon. There were still people who were left behind. And those that had been left behind continued to try to find ways to have their faith without the temple in the same way that those in Babylon continued to try to find ways to have their faith in a new land. So all of a sudden when the people begin to come back, you talk about two groups of people who don't really know how to get along. The people who had stayed and been in that area felt that this was their place and this was their area. They later become the Samaritans. The people who came back from Babylon believed that this was their place and this was their area and they should be the leaders. Well, you talk about a situation of too many chiefs and not enough Indians, it just wasn't pretty. And they thought, even though they had core beliefs and understandings of being God's people, they fought for hundreds of years and hated each other. Our current general minister and president, Sharon Watkins, actually used the story of the Good Samaritan in her article this week for our denomination following the election. I thought that was nice of her to use the scripture I'd chosen for the week. That was just really helpful in putting the sermon together. But this is what she says. In the story of the Good Samaritan, where the hero is a racial, religious minority, Jesus reminds us that our neighbor is the one next door or around the world who shows mercy. Jesus calls us to show mercy and receive mercy. Jesus calls us to love one another. The gospel does not change with an election. What the gospel requires of us does not change. Jesus' first inaugural address began with these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God, now and always, is on the side of the poor, and we who follow Jesus must be also. No matter who is in charge of our governments, we are charged with loving God and loving neighbor. Even in costly, self-sacrificial ways, we are called to be loyal to the reign of a sovereign God. Loyal to God. Not Hillary Clinton, not Donald Trump, not even the air conditioners. Loyal first and foremost to God. Loyal through our actions, not our labels that we place upon each other. And while I do believe that our voices and votes should be part of our understanding and relationship with God, we must not get so lost in those types of voices and forget to see the voice and hear the stories of life beyond the labels. We must continue to follow a gospel that calls us to show mercy. Dr. Watkins continued her article by saying, on this day, just like every day, our job as disciples of Christ is still the same as it was yesterday, as it will be tomorrow, to proclaim by what we say and what we do that God is a God of love. And we are people of love for all God's children. Our call is to work together for the common good, to welcome all to the table, all people, all races, ages, gender identities, abilities, religions, and yes, politics, and to find a way to work together and extend to each other across the whole human family the abundance of a generous God. 
That is good news. That we believe and love in a generous God. That we know a God that can come through in powerful and amazing ways in unexpected places. And while we at this time need to be gentle with ourselves and with others, we do not want to accept unloving actions, but we seek to understand why people are so hurting and what has led us to this place and how we as followers of Christ can help heal the divisions. So as we think about this time of giving, if you believe that this church, even those of you way back there, can bring more love to this world, bring more understanding, more of God's love and God's understanding, then I need you to recognize how much it matters that you are here and that we are here together and delving into difficult, wonderful, life-giving, sacred conversations. We are all the beautiful colors that God's kingdom should show us and be, and we are truly glorified and bringing those voices from the smallest one to the eldest one together. It's a difficult task that has been placed before us. And as we prepare for that task, to truly learn again and again how to love each other and love our neighbor, it would be nice as you think about what you're going to pledge to do it with working air conditioning. But we do it with working air conditioning because we know that that's what provides us comfort in the midst of ongoing challenges that will help us grow, help us know God better, help us understand Jesus better, and remind us that as followers of Christ again and again, every day, every week, and every moment, we are called to love our neighbor. 